Hello everybody, welcome to the Eternal Card Breakdown. My name is Pojo, and today we're going to be talking about all of the new cards from Whispers of the Throne, the new expansion. We're going to be discussing lore, we're going to be discussing playability, we're going to be discussing what kind of weird decks you can build with different things, and we're going to be talking about all of these cards in as many different ways as we can think to talk about them. So uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion of some cards here. Uh, I think that as far as this expansion goes, this is one of the weaker expansions that has been released. Uh, that's just my initial impression, of course, so it could change overall, but I've only seen a couple of strong cards, and some of the ones that I have played with, I've been disappointed with their performance, particularly against the common meta that already exists, which is dragons and strangers. Uh, you're seeing a lot of Grunaf Stranger, you're seeing a lot of... Uh, dragons and scary decks and then there's like unseen stuff as well um i feel like this really usually these sets provide like a lot of important answers to uh current meta in an attempt to shake things up and i'm not really sure if this uh, set is doing that job certainly we will see uh it's quite possible that the meta will change as a result of this expansion's release but uh thus far i have not seen a lot of changes i haven't seen a lot of different decks being played or a lot of different decks even like taking a whole on the ladder, at least in Expedition, and in Throne I'm not convinced that most of these cards will make it into Throne decks, so uh, as far as it goes this one might end up being a bit more of a pass for me than usual, so just letting you know that up front. But we're going to talk about the cards, we're going to talk about them individually, and uh, we got kind of a rough one to talk about first. Uh, Milo's Rebel Bomber, Charge Overwhelm, when Milo's hits the enemy player, put a firebomb into their deck. When the enemy player gains health, Milo's gets that much strength and health. Uh, this is a fun design for a card overall, so that's the, the main thing that I'm going to say about it is that as a... 3 cost 3-3, three, three, like it's got the right amount of stats. The charge and overwhelm works really well together. This card usually gets a firebomb, which is very rare for a firebomb card. And it's also a card that can sometimes get continuous firebombs. Firebombs are not typically all that bad to get. Uh, they do damage your long-term... Uh, effectiveness so like if you're playing like a slow control deck uh this is a card that you don't want to get hit with more than once but you're also usually going to answer it by that time if you're playing against like fast aggro stuff then yeah firebombs are kind of fun and this is kind of a fun card for that uh reason i don't think it's super powerful um the stat line 3 cost 3-3 three, three is very good in like a draft format or anything like that. The gain health ability is particularly solid if you're playing up against like something scary with life gain or anything that's actually trying to sort of stall your aggro. Uh, that's a pretty reasonable thing for Milos to have. It also means that you can't just gain your way, uh, gain life out of Milos's problems and it actually stalls that sort of gain life ability which is something that Fire is looking to do quite a lot. Uh, but obviously if you kill it with something like say a Cruciate then it doesn't really matter how much health and strength uh, Milos is getting, uh, that card is going to die. Like You can annihilate it, you can defile it, you can do any number of things to kill it before you gain health, and then you can just gain your health. So Milos doesn't really shape the battlefield all that much in terms of stuff, and therefore he's probably not a tier 1 card. Probably not even a tier 2 card, but even so, he's a fun aggro card, and I would say that he probably belongs in at least one aggro deck. I'd say that he's like a, a solid C somewhere. I think he's a reasonable aggressive option. He does do a lot of damage. The firebombs are useful. That's a lot of interesting things. Uh, so lore-wise for Whispers of the Throne, we have like sort of a return to different characters. Uh, I would say that this is a very past-influenced type of campaign. Uh, if it were a campaign, it is just an expansion. Uh, and each of these cards is revisiting a moment in Eternal's history. So this one is revisiting Milos's uh, explosive debut or explosive exit from Defiance, uh, where he blows up uh I think he blows up something in Korogat Palace, a garrison. He blows up a garrison. That can be seen in Casualties of the Cause as well. Um, it's also in Defiance, and uh, that's sort of the setup. Uh, that being said, this is a weird uh, version of the card. There's a lot of things that are kind of strange about it. Uh, first off, like in terms of like overall style guiding, this is something where Eternal has kind of really lack been lacking in like having a consistent style for its characters or even consistent voice actors for its characters. Uh, this particular Milos is very goofy. He uh, will call people bootlickers. He yells in kind of like a weird voice that isn't very familiar to anyone who has played with the other two Miloses before. And he also, like, when he dies, he plays the, some, the same voice line that he normally has, uh, but he says it in a different way, and it's kind of like 
uh, almost a little bit comedic. And in addition to that, he's a very comedic looking character. Milos was always kind of a goofy looking character, but I think that over the course of like Defiance in particular, and with the addition of uh, Milos Unwavering Idealist, this character kind of got established as like an unlikely, unlikely hero and also somebody who sacrificed themselves for a cause. And this kind of Yosemite Sam looking fellow is really a weird revisitation of that. I think it's kind of not really hitting the mark there on that front. It really kind of makes a joke out of a moment in defiance that was reasonably well executed. I didn't particularly enjoy it, but I think that it was at least done in a way that like made you feel something for Milos, and this is kind of a bad revisitation of that. It doesn't really do anything interesting on that front. Um, and on top of that, different voice, uh, kind of like a weird, silly presentation. I feel like it's kind of like just walking over the character's grave a little bit and it feels kind of wrong to play the card just for that reason i don't know it, it irritates the vorthos in me in a lot of different ways uh i don't mind the design of it at all but uh there's certainly something about like sort of the lore of it that makes me feel a little icky uh, next up, Praxis Trove. Uh, another example of how you can see that this is like uh, from the past. We have the original Talir with uh, red hair, and in fact, I believe it's a very young Talir uh, in comparison to the Talir that we normally see. Uh, so, Praxis Trove, this is when pr Talir is Archmagister of the Praxis Arcanum, and of course, has access to a wide variety of interesting Praxis tools. Talir, as of now, is currently uh, an advisor to the throne, as has resigned the Archmagister position to Bren, as I recall. Um, um, this card is really fun. Uh, I love playing with it. I've had a really good time with it. It says when you play a one-cost unit, you can play a random one-cost spell from your deck, then increase these abilities by one. Obviously, this is a really strong card in sort of like aggressive one-drop stuff. Uh, somebody's noting that Heart of the Vault is behind her. I believe that's correct. Uh, this is the Praxis Vault. Uh, the Heart of the Vault is deep within the Praxis Arcanum, so uh, this is definitely the Praxis Vault, and that is Heart of the Vault in the back, which is a good catch. Um, so, yeah, like overall you get like lots of fun spells off of this. You can try to control the randomness or you can try to play with the randomness. Uh, the decks that I've been playing have been trying to control the randomness and that's not been working out super well. We're doing Restrained Action Praxis Trove. It's a lot of fun, but it also fills the deck with so much stuff that it's a little hard to actually design a functional method to play things. I think this card actually does a little bit better in any sort of aggro setup, uh, particularly if you're doing aggressive dragons, which was already something that didn't really need a lot of help, but is certainly a fun take on that particular setup. So I think there's some pretty interesting things you can do with it. It plays very well in a lot of the like sort of Carvet Shrine decks where you are playing stuff like Kato, which plays a one and a two drop. Uh, you can definitely like get a lot of access to Praxis Trove uh, stuff from that and play cards like Combust and Devour while also just continuing to try and get to your Shrine to Carvet, which is pretty wild stuff. There's a lot of interesting things you can do that way. Um, overall, it's a solid flavor win for me. It's actually a fun card to play. It's reasonably well costed. It may be a card that you could see in a tier one deck. Uh, I think it's just like solid A on design, uh, solid B on power, and it certainly shouldn't be an A on power considering what it does. Um, but yeah, it's crazy good stuff. You do some really neat things with it, and it seems like a lot of fun to play. Uh, one of the winners of the expansion for me. Yushkov, Brutal Tyrant, revisiting Defiance again. Uh, I think we're actually like a little bit before Defiance as this character is uh, possibly... Yeah, I think that's actually Severin that he's kicking. I'm not really sure. Uh, but that's a 5-5. Once per turn, you may pay 3 and sacrifice another unit to deal its strength and damage to an enemy. Mastery 12, gain green, green, blue, blue, and create and draw Corivat Palace. So whether you're in red or not, you do get a Corivat Palace that you can access, and then you can play that and deal with other big stuff. Uh, this is kind of interesting for a lot of different reasons. Um, I believe that the mastery does not trigger off of Yushkov's ability. I haven't managed to test this yet, but I'm fairly certain that uh, it instead will trigger stuff like Throne Room and anything that like you want to trigger off of the unit itself, similar to how you would sacrifice other things to trigger infiltrates like Casualties of the Cause or other things along those lines. Um, Soul's Fury is another one that does that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, so that will deal its strength and damage to an enemy. I 
don't know if it's going to be Yushkov that does that or not. Um, either way, I'm pretty happy with it because you're going to trigger infiltrates off the unit or you can trigger the mastery off Yushkov. Um, overall, it seems like it's a solid design. Being a five cost in Expedition is pretty unfortunate right now as Banish is very, very popular. And being a five cost with no protection that also has to stay on board for a lot of the time to actually get its mastery is a little tricky at this point. I don't know if this card is really going to see a lot of play because of that sort of weakness in terms of power. Uh, I kind of like the design of it overall and it's nice to see another Yushkov. Certainly it's a fun card, but like I would say that overall it's not doing enough, and that mastery is almost impossible to get unless you are really utilizing that sacrifice ability to deal a lot of damage, at which point Koryavet Palace hardly matters. So yeah, I'm skeptical that this is going to do a lot, but it does have some removal sort of inherent in it since it can destroy enemy units. You can sacrifice your units to blow up other people's units, eventually get mastery, get a Koryavet Palace, and then have access to a weird green-blue card in red, which is kind of interesting, but uh, yeah, it's hard to say where exactly this card is going to belong just yet. Overall, it's like a, mm, a solid like B in design, and I would say like a C or a D in power. It's not amazingly good just yet, but it's got some potential. Archmaster, Archmagister's Portal. When you play a unit that doesn't share a name with any of your other units, or any of the units in your hand, deck, or void, it gets plus two, plus two. Useful for recursion effects, and also for any time where you're playing like a Heroes Resolve type format where you want to play a single unit over in a lot of different single units and play singleton in general. Um, overall, I don't find this going into a lot of my decks just because like three cost doesn't really provide a lot of power. Uh, the design of it is fine, especially if we ever actually do get a Heroes Rise event, but the power level of it is not particularly strong except in Heroes Rise, and in Heroes Rise it's kind of irritating that it's even there. I think that overall I'm not particularly psyched about this card, but I would be psyched to see another Heroes Rise event, so bring it on. Um, but yeah, like as far as it goes, it's not a very strong card, and like unless you're doing some interesting recursion shenanigans, it takes a lot to get this card running. Pesky Seedling, Killer, 2-3, summon increase the cost of a unit in the enemy player's hand by one, corrupted two. Uh, would be pretty interesting if this could increase the cost of multiple units, but it would also probably lock people out of decks very quickly. Uh, I think that it, as it stands, doesn't have a ton of power, but the increase the cost of a unit ability can be useful for keeping something out of your opponent's reach while you're killing off their small stuff and slowly getting into a, a wide variety of other things. The thing that really kills this card is the double time influence. Uh, at that point, you really can't play this card effectively in a lot of other decks, and if you're playing in mono time, you probably have better things to do, but it's hard to say for sure. Overall, I think it's not an incredibly strong card. It's a little bit awkward, but like it's you know a C and a C for me. It doesn't really do anything crazy. Uh, it also doesn't really have any sort of uh, lore attachment to it, which is not a requirement of Whispers of the Throne, but certainly uh, I think all of the other cards do, so eh, there's a, probably a few. And Mandrakes are cute, so cute Mandrake. Nothing wrong with that. Braun, Regal Courier, plus one maximum power, cards can't be stolen, five cost six, seven, ultimate pay eight to play an eight, eight giant. Uh, this does a lot. It's a big card at five. Uh, you get the plus one maximum power. The cards can't be stolen ability is very good. Overall, like in power level, this card seems very strong. The triple time influence is pretty tricky, but like this card does have like world bearer behemoth stats as well as a plus one maximum power on top of it. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have like an on attack trigger like world bearer behemoth isn't all that big of a deal. Uh, the ultimate is fairly useful, and you can like if you play brawn off of like some sort of ambush or other type of spell, uh, get that 8-8 giant on top of it pretty quickly, so there's some ways that this card can really get some immediate advantage, and the cards can't be stolen ability is relevant as well. Uh, that being said, it's a little slow in vanilla for Throne, like Throne is just kind of full of big time units at the moment, so I don't see it doing a lot there. This is primarily an expedition card, and in expedition, uh, the primary thing that you want to be doing is playing Grodas Stranger, which you can do with or without Brawn, so probably you'll do it without but we'll see. Uh, I think the card's really high on power level, but I don't really think that it necessarily plays in either format right now, because time is far too concerned with Grodoff Stranger to really play it, and uh, Expedition, or, well, in Expedition anyways, and in Throne, like, there's just so many options here uh, that the power level of the card really doesn't matter anymore. But it does do some cool things, and if you really need something to make sure your cards can't be stolen, that definitely is pretty interesting, and 
Obviously, the card is an insanely powerful vanilla unit, so I certainly wouldn't be surprised to see it somewhere. I'm just, uh, like, there are already, like, many things in different, uh, different uh, costs and time and values that can actually do a decent amount. Sinistral of Light. When the enemy player plays a card on your turn, Sinistral of Light gets plus two, plus two. I think this is a sleeper for one of the stronger cards. Uh, it has, uh, by the way, some old art. Uh, this used to belong to like an old beta card of some kind. I believe it got lifesteal when it had weapons played on it. Uh, so it's nice to see this card again. Um, but yeah, when the enemy player plays a card on your turn, Sinistral of Light gets plus two, plus two. Really cool piece of art in general. I actually really like this card. Uh, Mastery seven, create and draw a citywide ban. So really fun weapon carrier, especially if you can give it Aegises and other things like that. Uh, it survives like most first turn aggression, so you can play it down. It's not gonna get charred or blazing salvoed, which is really nice. And then you can start setting up weapons on it and putting it into a Voltron. Uh, if you can get an Aegis on it on top of those weapons, then it's a decent thing to build around because the play a card on your turn ability is fairly annoying and like combined with some good like counter spell action. Yeah, this could be a fun Huru card. I think uh, overall it's like a solid A for design, probably like a B for power, but it could be really insane and maybe even belong in some tier one decks. I think it's kind of interesting. So yeah, cool card, uh, cool design, cool art. Always liked this card. Council of Heroes. When any player plays a unit, double its strength and its health. When you play a unit, move each unit in your deck one card closer to the top. Uh, the Council of Heroes is the Relic, which is interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how a council... Uh, how the Council of Heroes is qualified in an artifact type form, but relics are a little bit weird like that sometimes, so that's fine. Uh, anyways, this card makes it so that every unit doubles its strength and health, which is pretty ridiculous. Uh, I don't know if that triggers on top of Kodosh's Stranger to get the plus four plus four on top of the deck. Um, I believe it's after the fact, but you can still do some pretty wild stuff with this, and obviously it makes it very easy to play like a lot of very aggressive strangers and a lot of decks that want to play basically nothing but units uh, very, very easily. Um, I think this card works best in decks that are actually trying to play Grodoff Stranger and that kind of thing, but also like it is a four cost relic, so it kind of belongs in a slot where it's fairly hard to play, and it's pretty easy to destroy, especially with uh, the dragons having access to draconic ire and most other decks having access to some kind of decent relic destruction in throne of course this is a card that gets blown up by um the cat sabertooth pride leader and when it gets blown up by sabertooth pride leader i'm pretty sure that sabertooth pride leader becomes a 610 so that's a bit of a problem for it in throne overall the power level of this card is not very good i like the design of it a lot but yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going to go in a lot of things. And if it does end up in Strangers, I'm probably not going to be super happy with it. We'll see. Roland's Warblade, 10 cost 510. What a great stat line. Costs one less for each of your units that died this game. That's fairly easy to do. Summon kill each enemy unit with five strength or more. Probably belongs best in some sort of Winchest sacrifice synergy. Uh, there's a lot of decks that do that right now. And in fact, this actually belongs pretty strongly in a I believe there's a Carvet deck that does this. Um, but yeah, like once again, usually when you see a new format, uh, when you see a new expansion, it releases a bunch of cards that are going to shake up the meta and make decks that aren't particularly strong stronger while making decks that are particularly strong less viable or at least like more likely to have some competition. This is a card that like I can see in a lot of different decks, but I can't really see it in uh, necessarily, a lot of these cards generally kind of help out decks that currently exist. And Roland's Warblade, eh, as far as what it's doing, I'm not really sure what it's after. Like there's certainly some thrown carpet shenanigans to play with it. Uh, you can play it in the market, which is really great. So it's got some similar set, set up to um, uh, Svetcha's the 6-6 six, six, uh, Stormhalt Knife is what it's called, uh, where you get like a lot of like sort of free cards out of your market that do like a lot of different things. Killing each enemy unit with five health or more is pretty powerful against time decks in particular. So this is a pretty heavy anti-time card in the market and potentially can even be accessed uh, at certain times out of like 
current expedition markets, although it's pretty hard to do that. You have to time your market card perfectly in order to get that going. So probably not a market card, but could be fun as a main board card if you're trying to do a bunch of sacrifice shenanigans. Uh, overall, it's pretty interesting. Like I like the stat line on it. I like the general ability of it. Uh, it seems like it's going to provide some interesting value and like a 10 health weapon. There's a couple of things that you can do with that in terms of having just a ton of health that might actually end up being very interesting. Amongst other things, you can balance it out with uh, the 5-5 uh, five five or something along those lines to make it so that it's a 10-10 weapon and that's kind of interesting there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with that uh, cool design uh, the lore here shows Roland training Caleb Caleb's holding like a toy sword in the background um, so like this is clearly a young Roland uh, and like a uh, a, an even younger Caleb but kind of an interesting bit of lore there showing a little bit of a uh, uh, camaraderie between the uncle and his nephew so cool cool stuff on that front declare victory uh, another lore card this one's showing Eileen uh, on her cloud snake declaring victory in Argentport I believe this is the first time that she invaded Argentport which is when she marries Kaifas so a uh, pretty important event I believe there's actually like two cards that actually cover this and yeah it's a fairly interesting uh thing overall you get to see like all the Skycrag people and like Island's general sort of uh favor and yeah this is what basically like causes a lot of like the weird family dynamics that you have as Aileen joins the family uh, very, very early on in Eternal's lore period. Um, negate an enemy spell with cost 5 or higher with triple blue as the influence cost. Zero cost fast spells are probably not supposed to be good, or zero cost counter spells are probably not supposed to be good. This one's definitely not that great. It's uh, like savagery cost, which savagery was not seeing a lot of play in general, and it also negates uh, harsh rolls, which is fairly good for flyers. You can definitely get your Shenra speaks out of the way and mess with people in that respect, but uh, if you're not facing off against a heavily creation market, this card does nothing and then you have less flyers to play, so it's a little bit harder to play it in the first place. Overall, I can see this being a bump for Elysian flyers if Elysian flyers were in fact intended to get back into the game, but I think that its power level is not high enough to really make a big difference, particularly since most dragon decks and most stranger decks don't really play spells with cost 5 or higher, at least not to the extent that having Declare Victory in your deck would be a good idea. Uh, could be fun in the market in a throne deck because you can definitely easily market it there, but in a expedition this doesn't really seem to add a lot so uh the throne room one of the more fun and interesting cards in the set three cost when one or more one or more of your units hits the enemy player you gain an aegis after the third time play a 7-7 duraka after the sixth play a 6-12 ilin this is one i had the most uh success with in experimenting with today uh it's fun with berserk flyers in particular anything with berserk is a good way to sort of get the throne room going and uh, i had some good times with it in expedition doing some sky track sky crag berserking fiddling around with those ideas very very cool stuff it's got a spellcraft three play, play savagery which i think i completely ignored when i had it last time but that's a good way to get the early aegis and protect your relic on the turn that you play it this is notable in that it's a relic that is very good at protecting itself it's pretty good in aggro lists as well which is very rare of the current relic sets and it's kind of fun with a lot of different things that you can be doing uh, the third time Doraka is very very powerful and uh, definitely helps out in getting to the 612 Ilin. if you keep the Doraka and play the Ilin, you've almost certainly won the game but more likely you're going to get the Doraka, and that will be either the deciding factor in whether the game is over or uh, not in either case, it's kind of a fun card. It's good in aggressive decks. I wouldn't say that it's particularly strong in control, but if you can find ways to repeat damage with, say, like Blitrock, uh, you can definitely get a lot of cards out of that, and that could be really fun in like a sort of Iron Thorn type throne list. This one's an A on both like power and uh, like design for me. I think that like there's probably a tier one deck in Expedition that likes it, and in Throne, I can at least see myself building a deck with it, which is a little bit more than I can say with some of the other uh, relics in this list so definitely not bad and uh pretty cool stuff this is the uh the event here is caleb challenging eileen for the throne uh i believe that's covered bef been covered before but it's still a cool piece of art and uh like it's really well done i like the lore design of this a lot and i think that whispers of the throne actually has some really good art in this uh entire set so 
Guardian of Spring, 7-6 Overwhelm, summon the enemy player, plays an Eye of Winter. What's not to love about this? 7-6 is a pretty big deal. The Eye of Winter is obviously very good because your opponent gets to selectively remove your cards, but uh, if they can't kill Guardian of Spring, that means that they have to spend two every turn to keep it locked down, which on a deck that is trying to do something aggressive is a lot. Like, it's fairly hard to deal with that, and uh, I would say that, like, overall, this puts some onus on your opponent to take control of the game, and if you're figuring out ways to destroy the Eye of Winter later, uh, <laughs> like, say, Krill... <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoy select, uh, suggesting Krill. Uh, I think this card's fairly decent. It's a good card to play off of like a restrained order or, or restraining action or some restrained action. That's what it's called. Thank you for the host Ilion, by the way. We're doing our card breakdowns here. Um, yeah, it's a fun card overall. It's got a lot of stats. Uh, obviously, if the card gets removed, it's very bad for you. Probably too bad for Throne, since Throne has very heavy on control. But it's kind of interesting in Expedition and other formats because it definitely puts a lot of pressure on your opponent. And if you can solve the puzzle of making it so the Eye of Winter doesn't matter, then it's pretty easy to get some very good value out of this, whether it's through Infinite Hourglass, Reinvigorate, uh, some sort of like... There's many different cards that give endurance, or many cards that destroy relics, all of which are kind of ridiculous, and then uh, Guardian of Spring is just kind of a fun card to follow up on. So, very cool stuff. Pretty interested in that card overall. Avoid Death, showing Svetcha defeating an Unseen Assassin. I'd actually forgotten that Unseen Assassins uh, did work for hire at all, or that they assassinated people for any particular reason. I think this one was hired by Yushkov. There you go. That's an Unseen with a motivation, a character motivation even. Uh, but yeah, okay, the enemy player discards a unit of your choice from their hand. So solid-ish against strangers, although strangers are generally trying to find ways to pull Grodoff Stranger uh, later in the game and then play it pretty quickly, so usually you won't get a Void Death off, but sometimes it happens. Um, even so, this is maybe a decent uh, sort of roadblock against strangers. It's a sabotage that works against units. It's very powerful. I think that you could see this in Throne and in Expedition, and like in both cases, it's probably going to do a lot of work for you because it makes sure that your opponent doesn't have units at the appropriate times, which is a really powerful effect. Uh, there's a reason that sabotage usually doesn't go after units. I think this is maybe one of the more powerful cards in the set for its particular purposes. Um, that being said, I'm still not sure if it's enough to like sort of disarm dragons or strangers, but I suggest running a lot of copies of it and finding out, because this seems like it's going to be kind of a sleeper hit for this uh, particular setup. Uh, I'm not a big fan of discard cards like this, because I always whiff them. It doesn't matter how likely it is that you're not going to whiff with them, I just, just do. But uh, even so, it's a cool card, um, it's a powerful card, and like... Uh, yeah, it's not like a favorite in design. I think it could even have like a fairly chilling effect on the meta, but especially for like decks that want to play unitless. But overall, not unreasonable, could be interesting, and uh, could be a lot of fun depending on what we're doing. Blight Moth! Flying, give an enemy unit in each enemy that shares the type with it, negative one, negative one, corrupted three. Solid, solid design. Uh, as a Kirin, this card does a lot, and like overall, like it definitely seems to be as from the preview event, one of the stronger cards. Kills tokens, messes with Carvet decks, definitely fiddles with a lot of different types of decks, blocks two threes, uh, is effective in a variety of different ways, and serves as good sacrifice fodder for other things. Uh, overall, this card has a lot of strengths uh, and not a lot of weaknesses. It is a low stat line, so it doesn't provide a lot of pressure, but the negative one, negative one effect on it has been very, very good uh, in pretty much every situation that I've seen it in. Sometimes it doesn't kill the thing you want it to kill, Kill, but typically it gets it on the second go around and that's not unreasonable. It's a slow card but it's a good control card and not a bad card to be playing for certain. Battle at the Gates. Kill each enemy unit that was played this turn, give them Voidbound, gain two health for each. Battle of the Gates can't be negated or stopped by Aegis. So notably an Aegis killer, good way to kill Unseen of that sort, but also probably only kills one unit and kills a unit selectively, which in general we have found to be fairly bad. Uh, the precursor to this was Crashing Avalanche, a card that at three did four, and also gained you card advantage because it had warp. Uh, that card was really unplayable, it turned out, and Battle at the Gates 
feels like it might still be unplayable. I'm not really sure if there's a lot of value in this. It is interesting to be able to kill Eunice with Aegis very easily in Shadow. Like, that's something that Shadow doesn't typically have access to. And for that reason, we might see it in Throner Expedition. But also, uh, it's a pretty big, meaty format right now. There's a lot of dragons. There's a lot of strangers. Uh, a lot of the Unseen that are coming out are going to be coming out a little bit faster than Battle at the Gates. So there probably aren't going to be a lot of them when the card comes out. I don't see a lot of people playing a lot of different cards into Battle at the Gates, although it might notably be a little fun against like a Shrine to Carvet type deck. Hard to say, I think it's just too slow, but the health gain is interesting in terms of like making up for that slowness, and the can't be negated, can't be stopped by Aegis thing is particularly interesting as an answer to decks that want to use a single threat and then like protect it with counter spells or protect it with Aegis and keep it alive. Um, the uh, the war here is uh, the Skycrag invasion of Argentport. Again, I think this is the first one and not the second one, since we've already seen the second one, and also this looks pretty brutal. Um, hard to say for sure, but it might be either one. In any case, it's uh, certainly interesting. Uh, cool card, really cool art, uh, but I don't really think the design or the power level is playable in either format. We'll see. Elem Keen Eyed. When you play another unit, gain one armor. Pay five and exhaust Elem to play a golem with strength and health equal to your number of units. We got to see all five of these cards, and this one's actually not bad. Um, I think all five of these are probably the better cards to be looking for in this expansion. Like, if you're buying the expansion, you're probably looking to get at least one of these three color cards and use them as a way to design a new deck. Elham Keen Eyed gives you a bunch of armor for playing units, which is fairly useful, and then also plays golems, which ends up being a really good way to sort of generate units and get value out of LM when you play them later in the game, which is pretty important because with that particular influence cost, it's hard to play them early. I think in either situation, LM gets enough value to be kind of justifiable. Certainly if you're playing with a decent amount of relic weapons and a decent number of units, you don't feel bad about LM, and getting that balance right, while always tricky, could potentially be a pretty serious deck. So that's got some good potential there. Like the design of the card overall, she seems great. Vox Nurturing Sadist. When you play a Nightmare, it gets plus one, plus one for each Nightmare in your Void. Exhaust and sacrifice two other units to gain four. The enemy player sacrifices a unit. This looks like a decently powerful effect. Uh, you can obviously do a lot of interesting Endless Nightmare decks, and the ones that I've seen so far have been decent. So, seems like a solid card overall. The plus one, plus one ability is uh, interesting, but not that relevant most of the time. And then the Exhaust ability is obviously very good in the late game. I think in both situations, like, it's, again, just doing enough as a two drop to sort of fix for different types of uh, cards and allow for different types of styles. Seems like it's kind of fun, certainly wouldn't hate it in uh, most decks, and uh, yeah, that's a reasonable option for uh, these three colors. Roscoe Rewarded! 3-3, three, three, when you play a dragon that you haven't played this game, draw from your void. Uh, a 2 cost 3-3 three, three in dragons is not really all that interesting, since most dragon decks are looking to play uh, not too many 2-drops, but also trying to play like 2-drops into 3-drops uh, into a big pile of dragons at the top. And it's fairly hard to play Roscoe Rewarded if you're playing Volatility, which is a card that you really, really want to be playing right now, because Volatility Dragons is very powerful. Um, Overall, I don't feel like this card adds a lot to dragons. Similar to the previous Razka, I think that it has a decent amount of stats, but the cost of it in influence means it's not going to be a particularly aggressive option, and I don't see how this replaces Teething Whelp as the premier two-drop of that list. It's possible that there's a more aggro list that comes out as a result of this, but you also have to go into all three colors for dragons, which means moving away from destruction in dragons, which isn't necessarily the biggest thing in the world, but it does provide some restriction to it. And then, like, the value of this card is debatable overall. Uh, notably is kind of fun with uh, certain cards like um, the 5-3 that uh, sacrifices units, so you can do some cool things with that. Uh, might be interesting if you can get some good stats on it, do some other things with it, uh, but, like, I'm not quite sure if this card is there in the current meta. It's certainly interesting, could change it up a little bit, but I don't think it has enough power to dragons in terms of what dragons want to be doing. 
Kaspar Oren of Kosul. Exalted, when Kaspar hits the enemy player, replenish your power. First time you activate a spellcraft or relic each turn, copy that ability. Uh, there's already some cool spellcraft relics. This is the card I'm probably most excited to be brewing with tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work with this card in general. Tradition is a faction that is really underexploited, so I'm looking forward to them getting some power. And I hope Kaspar is good. I wouldn't mind this card having a few more stats, but it's also an exalted unit at two, so uh, there's sincere possibility that it's already overpowered and we just don't know it yet. Um, still, the hits the enemy player ability is very good. The spellcraft ability is also very good since you can duplicate some really ridiculous spellcraft effects. Uh, I think Kaspar has some interesting synergies, but also is a little bit vulnerable to the current Blazing Salvo and Condemn Heavy uh, setups that dragons have, as well as most other decks. Uh, it also doesn't particularly perform very well against Anthem of Grodoff, so any market card kills it, which is a little bit unfortunate since the exalted ability is mediocre with its stat line and the cost is still a little bit prohibitive. That being said, this might be one of the more interesting cards and it might promote some tradition decks, which is a faction that is pretty sorely underrepresented in the current format, so I'm all for its design and I'm really hoping the power level gets there. Kilo Bold Innovator, another one of the more fun designs. 1-3, pay 2 exhaust. Sack a unit to play another unit from your deck with cost equal to the sacrifice unit plus 1 for each of its battle skills. In the preview event, this card behaved really, really interestingly. I really liked how it did behave. Um, it's a fun way to play around with Unseen that isn't as aggressive and high rolly as the current Unseen setups. It provides consistency to Unseen decks while also making Unseen decks a little bit more fun. Uh, I like this card's design. I think it's a good choice for the Unseen deck, and uh, I'm hoping to see a lot of it, and I'm hoping to not get too irritated with it. Um, it seems like a really interesting card. The, card. the decks that I've seen so far on the ladder have been fun to see, and overall it seems like it's uh, going to be a lot of fun to play. So yeah, this is a solid A for me, and I think it might be pretty powerful as well. It's probably going to belong in a tier 1 deck of some kind. And if not, the tier 2 deck that it's going to be in is going to be a load of fun to play. So got no problems with that. Certainly hoping that it sees some interesting stuff. Uh... Tempting offer, reduce the cost of the top five factionless deck of each player's deck by one. The event here is Vara looking at the throne, which I believe is a current event. This is uh, something new that's happening. Uh, Vara is considering using the throne, uh, and I believe that was something that was discussed in this month's lore. So, interesting uh, overall on that respect. The power level of it is not very high, since you need to have a decent amount of factionless cards, and also your opponent needs to not have some factionless cards, although you are screwing with your opponent's even-handed golems if you are playing it, so that's kind of fun. Uh, I kind of like this in monocolored decks, I think, since it allows you to enable stuff like veteran mercenary a little bit easier, and that can be a lot of fun to play with. I'm hoping to see some cool thrown monocolored decks, uh, maybe some like shadow monocolored lists. So like just mess with even handed golem even further while also playing like a wide variety of other things. We've built that deck before. Uh, this seems like a fun card overall in terms of like that sort of aspect to it. And as a way to shake up Throne a little bit by messing with even-handed decks, seems like a good choice. Uh, overall, I'm skeptical it's going to belong in a lot of decks, because a lot of the monocolored power always seem like they're going to be good, and then they just never do enough. Uh, like, we haven't really seen a lot of uh, Word of Soul or anything like that. Um, this one may be no different, but it is tempting, and certainly we are going to be tempted. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's basically where we're at with that. I think the card design is very good, the art is very good, the premium treatment on this is incredible, and like overall looks like a fancy card in that respect. So yeah, like I said, uh, the design here doesn't really seem to alleviate some of the current meta problems that we seem to be having. Uh, that's a little bit of a worry for me, but Overall, there are a couple of fun cards here, so if you're interested in those, uh, definitely give the set a look, and eventually uh, something might uh, arise that is important enough that you're going to want to get this uh, particular set anyways. It's also like a solid bit of work in terms of lore from Direwolf Digital, apart from the uh, Milos card, which, as we've said, we've had some problems with, uh, but like overall, I think that like it's a pretty well-designed set in terms of like giving you an interesting look at the lore of Eternal so far and the events that have been occurring up to this point, and also getting us back into a position to maybe be looking at Myria for maybe the next set. 
that would be kind of exciting. Uh, if it's not that, it's going to be like a Zolta Nightfall set, so either one should be kind of interesting. Uh, I'm really hoping that we go back to Myria, but I certainly don't know for sure. In any case, uh, here's hoping that the meta does get shaken up despite my predictions. I'm guessing that this is not going to be enough, but if so, maybe we'll see some interesting buffs or nerfs in the process as well. I'm certainly hoping that uh, other stuff comes into line. We do have some draft changes coming along as well. Lots of new cards have been cycled in. Reign of Frogs is in, so get used to using that against Grodas Stranger. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, like overall, there's a lot of interesting things to play with and hopefully some really good decks to build. So get at them. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, we will be back tomorrow for streams at 7 p.m. PST, and we're going to be recording new brews with these new cards uh, for the foreseeable future. I'm working from home this week, so I have uh, limited hours to stream and YouTube, but I should be getting a lot of stuff done uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, as well as getting some small brews and uh, other stuff out for this week. So look forward to that. I am, as always, on YouTube, Patreon, Twitch, and Twitter. We're going to throw up some thank yous to our Patreon people here uh, over there. Uh, so thank you to all of you folks. And uh, also we're going to be doing some brews very soon. So see you for those uh, when that happens. Thanks again for watching. I have been Pojo and cheers everyone.